Well, good morning. We haven't met. My name's Kevin. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are about to conclude our series, which we have illustriously named Unbound. It's about the Bible, and uh, I have the, the task of, of presenting genre to you this morning. I know. <laughs> Exciting stuff. Um, I'm going to try and make this as interesting as I possibly can. I'm going to start with a story, and that, that story has to do with um, my experience out of the gate in, in seminary. Any, anybody here ever go to seminary? Oh, we have one hand in the back. We have another one. Um, well, for those that have not been, often the conversation uh, turns to academia at seminary. And, um, and oftentimes people refer to seminary as cemetery for their spiritual life. Um, unfortunately, this has some truth in it. The truth in it is that when you go, um, I was reasonably naive as to what to expect. And um, having gotten a, you know, gone to the University of Wisconsin and gotten a marketing degree, you go right on there, right to seminary, you go, hmm. These are two different animals. But in my experience at school, um, the, the goal was for me was to get out of seminary without turning the Bible into a textbook. And it was difficult because cause of the way that they approach it, the way that you um, are taught to study it, the way that it's referred to as the text all the time. Anyway, all that to say this is that I also, when I was in college, was part of a, a group called the Navigators. Any, any Navigators in the room? Sorry. Uh, anybody else? Um, uh, I f fully enjoyed my experience with the Navigators. Uh, at, but what they taught, there were some great things that I learned with the Navigators, don't get me wrong. Um, but they, we did a thing called topical memory system. And in the topical memory system was taking verses and they put them on little cards and you would memorize them according to theme. And most all of them were taken out of context. I didn't know this until I went to seminary. And, and so I would sit in my seminary classes and go, wait, that's not how I learned that. That's not how I learned that either. That's... And so I sat there and learned a whole bunch of things new because of the way I was taught when I grew up. And, and for some people, it was very disheartening. It, it was very difficult. And for other people, it was very liberating. And for me, it was like, what's on the test? I just need to know what's on the test. Because I just need to pass this class and get out of here. That was the goal. Now, I was young and dumb. And... And part of that, too, though, was it kind of messed with me a little bit in my faith, in my walk with God, because some of the promises I thought were promises weren't really promises to me. Um, I read the Bible through the lens of myself and not through the lens that I was taught at school, and a whole bunch of things changed for me, and it was really good for me. But at the same time, it, it challenged me to rethink some of the things I thought I already knew. Okay, all that to say this. I'm about to tell you some things that you think you already know, okay? Everybody with me? Okay. I just want you to rethink them as we talk about the different genres of Scripture. And when I say genres of Scripture, what I'm talking about is the different literatures that are in it. How many of you have read the Bible through in a year? Bless you, bless you. Bless you. Have you. Did you pick a particular uh, reading plan? Any of you? Reading plans? Okay. Yeah. Hey, Brett. Um, did you enjoy the reading plan? No? <laughs> okay. Um, so all that to say this, is that oftentimes when we sit down to read the Bible, we sit down to read it to get something extract something from it. We're trying to find something for ourselves. We're trying to read it in such a way that it speaks to me in my situation at my time. You know, you can flip the Bible open, put your finger on it and go, okay, 
this is, this is for me today. That's the way God is going to speak to me. It's really not how the Bible's written, and it's not the way it was intended to be read. And if you picked up the Bible and started at the beginning and decided to read it all the way through from beginning to end, what you will find is that you're not reading a novel, which you all know. It's not a novel from beginning to end. It has a lot of narrative in it, but it also has a lot of poetry in it. It has some wisdom literature in it. It has some prophetic uh, literature in it. It has apocalyptic literature in it. It has letters. It has gospels. It has all kinds of stuff and you read them all differently, okay? And, and part of what I'm going to try to do in this half an hour of, of academia, which I'm trying not to make it, is to invite you into reading it a little different. And so what I'm going to do is present to you a lens by which you sit down and approach the Bible to address, and then I will speak to each one of the genres of Scripture and how kind of that fits into this storyline that I'm about to tell you. All right? That's my precursor to this message. And you're all going, oh boy. Hang with me. It'll be great. Okay. So we start with this idea. And this is, this is one of the things. And what I'm telling you is not novel. It's not new. It's something I learned when I was at seminary that helped me understand how to read the Bible. So this is something that's probably propagated among you in some form or fashion. And so bear with me for just a minute. I'm going to give you the meta story of the Bible. Meta. Got it? Okay. Big story. I'm not trying to fill in details. I'm not trying to, and I know that you know this, but I need you to remember what I'm about to tell you is really important when you sit down and start reading the Bible. This is, this is point number one, okay? And the point number one is this. The most important point that you're going to get out of me today is this, is that the narrative of the Bible has a main character. His name is God, called Yahweh, sometimes Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. He is the main character. You are not. So if you walk away from anything else in this conversation, that's what I want you to walk away with, is that God is the main character, and we are introduced to him in the first sentence of the Bible in Genesis 1.1. You've all heard this before. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's not news, but this is the deal, is that this is really important because we are introduced to the pro protagonist of the story, the main character right out of the gate. And he is the one that ultimately is called the creator. He has got multiple names through scripture, and you can read about them, but ultimately who we're talking about is God, right? Story is all about God. Everybody good? Okay. This is, becomes the problem a little later in the story when we start reading ourselves in as God. Can't do that. And so when we're reading different parts of scripture, we've got to remember this part of the story. And so he does his work for a few chapters, and then we're introduced to the protagonist, or I'm sorry, to the antagonist. And that's in chapter 3 um, of Genesis, and it says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Everything up until this point is good. Everything is good. And then we're introduced to the antagonist. We have the protagonist and the antagonist, and we have the creation, right? I know you know this, but bear with me. So the Old Testament is written from this point on with understanding, when you read the Old Testament, you understand it in this context. You understand it as God is the protagonist and, and the evil one, Satan. He's got a bunch of different names throughout the Old Testament, and his, he is the antagonist. But the antagonist also has the capacity to enlist some of the minions. Minions, is that right? No, demons. Some of the demons <laughs> that have fallen with him <laughs> My bad. I was thinking, never mind what I was thinking. Did you know that there's a minion named Kevin? <laughs> Sidebar, yeah. Anyway, so Kevin's can be enlisted into the allegiance of the, of the antagonist, but the enemy is able to enlist us into or opposing people and principalities into his war against the protagonist. And 
this is really important. The people are what they are fighting over. The conflict is over the creation. The conflict is over the people that are made in the image of God. And so there's this conflict that exists between the protagonist and the antagonist, and we are the prize. And the antagonist can enlist some of the created in the image bearers of God into his service along with his minions, along with the demons, along with the principalities. Got it? I know you know this, but I just want to make sure everybody understands the conflict. Because the conflict is ultimately what sets the stage for the rest of the story. Good. If you have a question, you can text me. I think the text line's up. Yep. Okay. So that's the, and so we go through the Old Testament, and as we go through the Old Testament, we see the rebellion of people, we see the ongoing conflict, we see, we see um, the division between God and his people over and over again. And we see temptation, we see failure, we see repentance, we see people coming back to God, God restoring, and then we rinse and we repeat and we do it all over again. All you have to do is read the book of Judges. If you read the book of Judges ever in your life, you would see the story of mankind. Mankind. mankind does aligns itself with God. They walk with God for a while. They get tempted by other gods. They fall away. They get disciplined by God or taken into exile. God sends a deliverer. They're forgiven. They're restored. They have a time of peace. They have a time we walk with God, and then they just do it over and over again. If you watch history, it's not just a biblical thing. It's a historical thing. It's the nature of the story. But the hero always is the protagonist. It's God. Okay. So then the story continues in Scripture, and we get to the Gospels where there's a twist in the story. So we, we make it through the Old Testament, and then in this meta narrative look, we begin to see that something changed when the New Testament pops up, and we see the Gospels, right? We see the Gospels, and we see something really significant. Verse 14 of John chapter 1, it says, The Word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace. We see the reintroduction of the protagonist, but this time, he comes in human form, and we know him as Jesus. But it's the same protagonist. It's the same hero. It's the same God coming this time and the flesh. But then in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, we are reintroduced to the antagonist again, and that's the Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So now we have them both at play again, this time in the Gospels. The Gospels is a little different type of genre. It's a genre, a type of literature that is, is meant to reveal or to expose who is the Gospel all about, and it's about Jesus. So we get four different Gospels, thankfully, from four different perspectives. If you can imagine the Gospels as being Jesus being in the middle, and you've got your four different writers all around, and they all write from different perspectives, so we get a full, rounded perspective of who Jesus is. Not all of who Jesus is, but we get a, a full, round perspective. And then, the story has a twist to it. Because if you read through the Gospels and you didn't know the end, if you did not know the end, this is like a great plot twist. It's like, it's like that Darth Vader actually lived after he was fried on that, in, the, in the fire, which none of you are getting that reference, but that's okay. <laughs> but there's a plot twist here, and that plot twist is this, is that if you read it from beginning to end, and you didn't know that Jesus died, you would not think that Jesus was going to die, except for he gives hints about it along the way, and that he's actually crucified. He actually gives up his life. That's a, that's a moment in the story that's a twist in the plot. And the other twist in the plot is that he's raised from the dead. And the other twist in the plot is he doesn't stay after that. He goes up to heaven and he brings the Holy Spirit. And so we get all these different iterations of the pro protagonist, but the protagonist ultimately is the hero who dies and rises from the dead. Right, that's the gospel. You're all going, yeah, I get this, Kevin, I understand that. It's great. Again, I'm gonna circle back here in a minute so that we can talk about all the different, why there's different genres in the Bible and why it speaks to this idea. And if we have this meta idea in our minds when we approach it, it helps us understand what we're reading. Okay. And the protagonist, while he was here, gave us a new command. 
And his new command is found in John chapter 13, 34 and 35. He says, a new command I give you is that you love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, if you understand the conflict, again, you got to go back to the conflict. The conflict is between the protagonist and the antagonist. The antagonist is trying to keep away or take away that which is most valuable to the protagonist, just like any good story. Any good story is there's a conflict, and that conflict is over something, and that something is us, and that something is the created in the image of God people. And the antagonist's goal is to keep them away from the protagonist because the protagonist loves them. And so the Old Testament is this ongoing journey. You get to the New Testament, and now everything shifts, and there's an understanding that takes place here is that there's something has changed in the relationship between God and men. And it's called the New Covenant. I'll get to that in a minute. But therein lies the story. The story is something has shifted. And then Jesus ascends into heaven. And there's a bunch of letters then that come afterwards that are written to the followers of the one of the way, the one that said to love one another, the Jesus. And those are the letters of Paul and Peter and James. And we read those differently than we read other things. And then finally, we get to the book of Revelation. I'm not going to dwell much on the book of Revelation because we're going to be in it for the next two months. And so if you're wondering what we're doing next, if you haven't heard, we're doing Revelation. But I want to read the end of the story so that we get... We're not at the end of the story, us, but this is what is to come. And Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 5, it says this. And this is, this is such a great picture. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. If you want to memorize something, there you go. That's the end of the story. The end of the story is the resolve is, the revel- is, is in the revelation is, is that we see a new city, a new relationship, a relationship that is no longer an, a part of the conflict with the antagonist. Prior to this in Revelation, the antagonist is thrown into the fiery lake of this bad place. <laughs> so the narrative tells this story. And, and it's the relationship between God and his creation and the battle of redemption. It's a great story. It is the creatures so desperately wanting to be the protagonist. We want to be the creator. We want to be the hero of the story. We want it to be all about us because ultimately we want to be our own God. And we get that little voice in our ear, the antagonist saying, you deserve to know. You deserve to be your own God. You shouldn't have to serve him. And so there's this conflict. The Bible has all kinds of sections and books and things and narratives on this meta level. And that is the lens in which we approach scripture. So when you see, this is one of the things they taught me at seminary that has stuck with me and has helped me over the years is when I sit down to read the Bible, I have in mind the meta narrative. And the meta narrative about God's interaction with his creation. You are so valuable. This is, I want to impress this upon you. You are so valuable to God. That he's been, he's been in this tug of war with his antagonists since the beginning of time for you. It fascinates me. And so when you come to the Bible, you're, you're entering into that, that idea. 
you're entering into the battle in ways that you see it written down and you see the narratives play their uh, role. You see how um, each one of these different types of, of literature are written so that we get an idea of either A, what is the creator like? Who is he? Describing the creator. So when you get to the Psalms, you begin to read that through the lens of he's describing mostly who God is and his relationship with me, with, with whoever's writing. He describes how to worship. He describes, so there's, there's a beauty to that. And then there's Lamentations. You read Lamentations. Anybody read Lamentations? I can only do it for like half a minute. It's so depressing. But what it is is the pouring out of the failures of the heart of the people before a God who has sought them. And, and you begin to recognize the, the, the give and take of these different literatures designed for us to understand this tug of war between God and the antagonist and the failures of humans in it and the successes of humans in it. But ultimately, the hero being God himself. And so in order to better explain that, and I, and I know, okay, again, I told you up front, I'm going to tell you things you already know. But there are five covenants that are given in the Bible, and I'm going to, they're going to come up here on the screen. And the reason I'm giving you these five covenants, I'm going to breeze over a couple of them, is because without understanding the covenants between God and men, it's really difficult to understand things like the prophets. It's hard to understand um, uh, even some of the prophecy about the Messiah, it's hard to understand those things because what's taking place is in these covenants is, is part of the rekindling of the relationship between God and man and, and him expressing his love to us in such a way that it's tangible and how we participate in it. It's a participation sport. I know we don't think so sometimes. But anyway, there's five. And it, some people do think there's more, but I'm doing the abbreviated version today because I, they gave me a half an hour. Okay. So there's the Noahic, the Abrahamic, Mosaic, the Davidic, and the New Covenant. And the, the one I want to focus on, obviously, this morning is the New Covenant. But uh, the Noahic was after the flood. Uh, God said, I'll never flood the, the planet again, gave us a rainbow. That's all I'm going to say about that. Everybody okay with that? It was God dependent. It was God's deal. It was God saying, I'm, I'm making a vow, and we're good. Okay. The next one is the Abrahamic. And this was God calling out a specific person to have a specific people to do a specific thing. And I'm going to read the covenant, and it's found in Genesis 12. There's more to it, but I'm going <clears> to, <throat> again, doing the abbreviated version, and if you have questions about this, feel free, text me. Um, or if you want to interrupt me, feel free. The Lord has said, had, had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This was to establish a people of his own that would bless all the peoples of the world. It was meant to be a, a people that would reflect the heart of Yahweh, of God, God the Father. <coughs> and it was the beginning of the people of Israel. And then there's a bunch of stories about the patriarchs and testing the faith of them and different things. But as you, as you watch that play itself out, you begin to recognize in the great curve of the meta, if you read it through the um, 30,000 foot view of the story, you begin to recognize what God is doing. He's creating a people that would show the power of the one true God. That's what he's doing with the intent of blessing all the people so that the people would look on the people of the world would look on this people and go, oh, that's the true God. Because he wanted to be known. All right? That's, that's that covenant. And so when you read those stories, and the failings often come when, 
when the patriarchs don't bless other people, but they curse them. They become, they become part of the culture around them. They don't become distinct. They don't become a peculiar people. They become like the people around them. And that's the theme that you start to see unfold. So when you read in Genesis about the patriarchs and you read um, about Joseph and Isaac and all the guys, Jacob, you begin to recognize, oh, this is the plan unfolding. This is the relationship between God and his people. These are his people. And then they end up in slavery in Egypt. <coughs> and there becomes uh, a new covenant, okay, a different covenant. It's called the Mosaic Covenant. And this is probably the one that causes the most angst for those of us who are um, Bible readers. And, <coughs> and partly because it taints the Mosaic Covenant kind of, oh, what did I do? Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> Usually it was like, okay, you're done. Um, <laughs> I have nine minutes. I got to talk faster. Okay, this, this, uh, this, the, the Mosaic Covenant is the agreement that happens on the um, Mount Sinai between Moses and God. And he says, this is the law for my people. This covenant is specific. It is a, an agreement between a people and God. This time, God has expectations for the people. And they will be blessed if they obey, and they will be cursed if they don't obey. And what happens from this moment on is there's a recognition of the fact that they keep coming back to this, the law of Moses, the law of Moses, the law of Moses. And they come back to this because it is the agreement between God and his people that this is how you are supposed to behave. I'm to be your only God. They also, they, so they go and have multiple gods, and you begin to see, oh, they're, oh. And, and, and so they end up, God sends a prophet and says, don't do that, right? So when you read the prophets, this is a genre, a specific type of literature. When you read the prophets, you read it through the lens of this. You read it through, oh, they, they're not keeping their end of the deal with God, so he sends a prophet, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea. You read down the list, and he's talking to the nation Israel and says, you're not upholding your end of the deal. You are not being the nation I need you to be. Stop worshiping false gods. Come back to me. That's how that is to be read. Now, there's portions of prophets that are a little more specific to the Messiah, the coming Messiah, because we hear strains of that throughout the Old Testament. We see shadows and pictures, but that's like 5% of the prophets. Most of it is a prophet standing up and saying to Israel, you can't worship Baal and worship Yahweh. That doesn't go together. You have to forsake this God and turn back. If you don't, this is what's going to happen to you. And it does. All probably, usually in their lifetime. That's prophecy. That's, the, that's how you read that. So why read it? People have literally, somebody came up afterwards and said, so why would we read the prophets? I said, because it, it speaks to the heart of God trying to draw people back to himself. It speaks to the fact that he is long-suffering. This took over periods of years and years of time of him saying, no, don't, don't come back, come back. He was a, a long-suffering, patient God. And eventually he sends him into exile. So we have some, some whole experiences with foreign governments and all kinds of fun stuff. But we read that through this lens of the meta-narrative of, I want a people for myself so that the world will know the heart of Yahweh, God. And he's the redeemer. So those, and so then we get one more covenant, and that one more covenant is the Davidic covenant, covenant. And the Davidic covenant is the covenant of when we realize that God makes, God is now predicting the coming king and David being the first legitimate king, there was Saul, and then the mantle was removed from Saul, but then David. And David becomes the line of the Messiah. And in that Davidic covenant is the promise of the coming one who will sit on the throne forever. And so the rest of the, rest of the Old Testament then speaks to this whole idea of these covenants. Now, so when you sit down and read the Old Testament, when you sit down and read it, 
you understand that what you're reading into is a people that were called by God to be a peculiar people that were to be people who loved one another. I know that that's more of a New Testament principle, but ultimately when you read the law, you begin to recognize, oh, we're not supposed to steal from each other. We're not supposed to envy each other's stuff. We're not supposed to covet. We're not supposed to... That, those are laws of governing relationship between each other. They're to treat each other with the respect. You're not supposed to kill each other. And then there's also this segment that says you're supposed to love him with all your heart, meaning you have no other God before me. You don't take my name in vain. You don't treat me as though I'm an afterthought. And so there's this relational component with God, there's a relational component with each other, and it reflects the heart of God in the community. And as the community then builds around this idea of the heart of Yahweh, it is exposed then the heart of Yahweh to the rest of the world. And they failed miserably. But God was always faithful. God always kept a remnant. God always forgave. God always came back. God always brought them back into some kind of understanding. But they kept drifting away because the antagonist was still at play. The antagonist doesn't get vanquished until the end. And so the antagonist is still in play for us. And so when you get to the New Testament and you start talking about the New Covenant and you start talking about what happens in the, in the Gospels and you sit at the table with Jesus and there's a realization that, oh, when I sit at the table, this is a New Covenant. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic Covenant. He's the fulfillment of the law. He's the fulfillment of all that was transpiring in the Old Testament. But it's Yahweh in the flesh. God in the flesh has shown up which then shines this light on the New Testament in a little different way because he says, I am the new covenant and the new covenant is my blood and you have relationship now with me predicated not upon keeping the law because that was the old covenant. So now you come into the new covenant and he's saying, those things I have fulfilled and so with that in my relationship with you comes this idea that I can now be in relationship with God in a way that is different than ever was before, and I now move into this new covenant which is predicated again upon God, not my behavior, not my ability to obey. And so the new covenant takes away my sins. The new covenant creates a new community, and the new community has, is not Jew or Gentile, it's not slave or free, it's not male or female, it is of the whole, there's no hierarchy in it, and everyone, as we've been saying for the last year, is welcome at the table, where he introduces the new covenant, where he says the, the body and the blood, when he says the new covenant is in my blood, when we drink that, we're saying we agree with the new covenant that we are now part of that. And that new covenant is the expression of the heart of God to create a new community that the world would figure out that, oh, look how they love one another. They must be followers of Jesus. And we begin to see a different way now to read the Bible again. We read the Gospels to discover the way of Jesus, the revealing of Jesus. We read Acts as the, as the story of the Holy Spirit working out. Another, another protagonist is introduced, and in that protagonist, we begin to see how it plays out in the church and how this church spreads and a communities of people come together. Now, the antagonist is still at work. And so what happens is you get a group of people together and they start being people. <laughs> and when you got people doing people stuff, you got problems. And when you got people doing people stuff, you got to correct them. And so the letters, when you read the letters, you begin to understand that most of them are written to churches that were doing something stupid. They'd missed the mark. Somewhere in there, the antagonist had found a way to divide them, be disunified, steal their freedom, have them um, diminish people who were lower than them economically. And it was a, a myriad of things. 
They were not being the people of God. And so Paul and John and Peter wrote letters. And those letters are by design written by an occasion where they needed to either encourage them to move in another direction, rebuke them for something they were doing, change it up. But what they do when they write that is, is they say, look, this is Jesus. Remember the gospel? Remember the gospel? Remember the gospel? Jesus said, love one another, encourage one another, walk with one another, bear one another's burdens. So stop being jerks. If I could sum up a letter. <laughs> but what happens is the constant need for encouragement to come back. To stop wandering away. And then some of those letters are written to individuals. They're written in such a way to encourage them and to spell out how the church should function and, and to show what it really means to love one another, encourage one another. So the letters are written with an, a lens through which we see the protagonist. So we know that Jesus came. We know that he showed us the way we were supposed to live. We know that he died. We know that he rose from the dead. We know that he ascended into heaven. And we find ourselves sitting in a group of people that go, we all believe that. And if we all believe that, then there is a sense of where we all believe that he said we ought to love one another. And if we ought to love one another, it's the deepest demonstration of the protagonist saying, these are my people. You can see it because it doesn't matter that they're all different. It doesn't matter that they're ethnically diverse. It doesn't matter that they're economically diverse. It doesn't matter because I brought them all together and they have one thing in common. The new covenant. The protagonist. And that's how we read the Bible. We take the big picture and we sit down and we open the Bible and we go, oh, there must, and we don't know what they were doing wrong in those New Testament churches. We can guess, and we do. We try to figure it out by what he's trying to correct. But let's just assume we're not getting it right because there isn't a church on the planet that gets it right all the time. But we are to forgive one another like the one who gave the new covenant. We are to love one another like the one who gave the new covenant. We are to encourage one another. We are to bear one another's burdens and we are to forgive each other's sins. We are to pray for one another. Oh, let's do that. Not because, not because it earns something with the protagonist, but because it's the heart of the protagonist. And we want to be his people. The story starts. God created humans so he could be in relationship with them. He just wants to be in relationship with you. He's quick to forgive, he's quick to rescue. Long on patience. And he's long, long suffering. Which I am eternally grateful for. For I fail and I repent and he restores. I fail, I repent, and he restores. Because the new covenant is in his blood, and I've been washed in his blood. And so have you. So I want to invite you to the table. I know that's a long story. But the table is the expression of the heart of God. Jesus went to the cross that is for us. To bridge that gap. To be able to invite you in. To be able to tear the curtain in two. So that you might be able to enter the holiest of places in the presence of God. It's a privilege. It's also grace. And so today we celebrate the table. At each one of those stations, if you're new with us, there's communion at each of those tables. Take a piece of bread. You can dip it in the juice. You can bring it back to your seat. We also would love to pray for you. You can write down a note. We can, you can put it in, the, in one of the holes around here or in one of the boxes. We also 
place to give. You move around while they're singing these songs, but my prayer for you, for me, for us, is that we would be that community that is aligned with God in such a way that we would love one another. We would love one another as he loved us. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you for these few moments of thinking about the greater story that we're a part of, that you've invited us into. Thank you that we're not the hero of the story, but Lord, thank you that we're the prize. That the conflict is over your image bearers, us. May we find ourselves drawn deeper and deeper into a, a relationship with you that just permeates the way we live. And may we encourage one another and love one another and walk with one another in such a way that we bear one another's burdens. And may that story of the gospel, as it comes to us, as we sit and we read the letters and we read the Psalms and we read the wisdom literature, that we wouldn't just get caught up in, you know, oh, what does this mean for me? But may we sit and wonder what does this tell me about you? The depths of your love for me. Us. The community you're trying to create. The bond of love that should exist among your people. And may we find ourselves releasing our prejudice. May we find ourselves releasing our judgments. And may we find peace in the new covenant, which is in your blood. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.